Well, good morning. Uh, thanks for having me. My name is Preston Mann, Director of Political Affairs for Oregon Business and Industry. Uh, thank you for pulling me out of Salem, where we're in the middle of lunch days. Couldn't ask for a more beautiful location to, to talk to you about a pretty serious subject today. Uh, but hopefully you'll walk away from this morning's presentation with a, a better understanding of what Measure 118 is, why our organization and our coalition is so concerned about it, and what you can do to help us defeat it. Uh, but before I get started, I just wanted to say thank you to, to David as a, as a member of our board, um, just a fantastic member of our board, and to your chamber as being a partner with our organization. You know, we, I'll get to it in a little bit, but you can join our coalition. It's kind of a long story, but there's a, there's a spreadsheet that I can see on the back end of our interface, and I, it's sort of my social media for the moment. Um, every day I go in there and I see who joined the coalition, where are they from, what's the business name, what's the organization, and very early on when we launched that, it was very clear that this chamber was working really hard to spread the word. Uh, if you were to go into the first probably 50 to 100 individuals and organizations and businesses that joined our coalition, a lot of them are from the North Coast. So that's credit to, to David, to the chamber, to all of you for, for being so proactive, and we thank you for that. Uh, again, I'm with Oregon Business and Industry. Uh, for those of you that may be a little bit less familiar with our organization, we are the state's Chamber of Commerce. We're also the affiliate for the National Association of Manufacturers and the National Retail Federation. We've got about 1,600 members across the state. 80% of those members are small businesses, and they employ about a quarter million Oregonians. Uh, we've got a lot going on. Uh, Measure 118 is taking up a lot of my time personally and a lot of my colleagues' time. Uh, but we're also involved in some of the other issues that you've heard about this morning. The Climate Protection Program, uh, that is a very important piece of public policy that is in a very critical stage right now, the public comment period. So I would certainly encourage you um, to take a look at that handout and if it's something you're interested in, please do engage before the end of the week. Uh, please send in comments uh, expressing your concerns. But more to the point, uh, Measure 118. It might be hard to believe. Do we have any candidates for public office in the room, by the way? Okay, not this morning. Uh, for those candidates, it may be a little more believable. Um, and for those of us working on campaigns, this you know, 22 days and 42 days feels like a very long time. But there are only 22 days until ballots are mailed to Oregonians. And you all know that in Oregon, ballots, as soon as you receive your ballot, you can effectively vote. So I like to think of Oregon as having basically 20 election days between the time that you receive your ballot and the actual day we get results, you can vote at any time. And so in terms of this campaign and spreading the word about Measure 118, I tend to think of this effort as we've got 22 days left to give out as much factual information as possible and help Oregonians come to their own conclusions. In my opinion, that conclusion should be a no on Measure 118 but at least understand what this measure is, where it came from, and what it's about. Again, just 22 days until ballots go out. Uh, I have a little notepad next to my bed every morning and I'm just crossing it off because this is a, a little bit of a, an unwelcome gauntlet for those of us working on it, but uh, the reality is it's gonna be here before we know it. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about where this measure came from before I dive into what exactly uh, it does. Uh, we get this question, a lot, so might as well just lead with it. The proponents will tell you it was drafted in a copy shop in Eugene. Um, I'll let you be the judge of if that is the most appropriate place to draft complicated tax policy that would be the largest tax increase of its kind in state history. I'm generally of the opinion that that's probably not at the best place, but uh, you get the picture. While it was drafted at a coffee shop, the vast, vast majority of the funding for the measure has come from out of state. Fully 97% of the money has come from out of state. Most of that has come from a very small group of Californians. Uh, the most recent check was a $100,000 check from a San Francisco tech entrepreneur and mayoral candidates. Uh, but the supporters of this measure have proven themselves to be very well organized. Um, to put it bluntly, they are playing to win. Uh, it is not easy to qualify a ballot measure for the ballot. Uh, it takes a lot of work, and they raised a significant amount of money, about a million dollars, to do it. But it, it represents a pretty sophisticated operation. Um, there's lots of technical nuances. Obviously, you have to collect the signatures themselves. It's impressive. And since then, they've retained uh, PR consultants from across the country. 
They launch a series of digital ad flights. They have political consultants and Google search ads. Again, they are playing to win, and we are taking them as seriously as we possibly can. All right, so what does the measure do? It's a four-page measure, and that might seem a little bit short, but I promise you the, the more you read it, the longer you stare at it, the more questions you have, and I hope to answer some of your questions uh, today. Although it is, as I mentioned, a, a complicated measure for just having four pages. It turns out when you try to draft tax policy, there are all sorts of unintended consequences that come to the fore. But at its core, uh, this is a gross receipts tax. It's a tax on sales above $25 million. Uh, the tax rate is 3%. Uh, and sales means it is applied to top line revenue, not income or profit. You can lose money and still be forced to pay this tax. Sales applies very broadly to goods and services. There are no exclusions or ex exemptions to what goods or services can be taxed. It applies to both C-Corps and S-Corps, and it is separate and additional to the corporate activity tax that some of you uh, may have some, some familiarity with. So it is a, a very large tax on sales, sales above $25 million, and the revenue generated by this tax, about $6.8 million per year, which again is far and away the largest tax increase in our state history, is to be rebated to Oregonians in equal amounts. Uh, there, the eligibility for receiving a rebate is simply being in Oregon for, for 200 days. That's not based on residence status, taxpayer status. It's just have you been in Oregon for 200 days. Uh, it's up to the Department of Revenue to, to try and figure out how exactly they're going to determine if you've been in Oregon for 200 days. Uh, I think it's gonna be a, a complicated mess for them if this were to be implemented. It's part of the reason they've said they'll need to hire as many as 199 employees just to facilitate this program. Uh, and the income is not taxable in Oregon, but we do believe it is taxable at the federal level. One piece of information about Measure 118 that drives me in particular crazy is that if this measure were to be adopted by Oregon voters this November, it kicks in almost immediately, January 1, 2025. And those of you running businesses know that uh, for a tax of this magnitude to kick in that quickly is, is just a recipe for disaster. I don't think most of the pro-tax groups in Salem or pro-tax legislators in Salem would ever consider implementing a tax of this magnitude on such a short timeline. It would create enormous economic ripples throughout the community. So that personally directly is one of the biggest offenses for me in this measure. But one other thing to keep in mind, and speaking of legislators, is that while the proponents talk about the rebates and you know all the different features of this tax measure, there is nothing about this measure that, that prevents the legislature from changing it moving forward. And some of you are probably thinking, well, you know, maybe they'll improve it if it were to be adopted. Maybe, but there's a lot of other changes they could make to this measure, largely on simple majority votes. They could lower or eliminate the $25 million sales tax threshold, threshold excuse me. Uh, they could tax more types of business, businesses, they could decide to means test the rebate or keep a portion of it for themselves, or they could raise the rate. So I get the question a lot of, you know, can they change it, will they change it? We don't know. Um, certainly recent history suggests that legislators are interested in changing ballot measures to, to fit more with their policy beliefs. Uh, but if you caught K2 news this weekend, um, a political science professor from Pacific University was, was talking about this exact measure. This is not a constitutional measure, it's a statutory measure, which means legislators are not bound in any way, they can change it in any way they want. So what are the consequences of this measure? As I mentioned, $6.8 billion in new taxes on corporations in the first year alone. It's really hard for me when I give these presentations to just to quantify in, in comparative fashion how significant amount of taxes that is. It is would be the largest tax increase in our state his, our state's history. It's frankly not even close. Uh, the corporate activity tax that I mentioned earlier is several orders smaller in terms of the revenue it generates. This is an enormous tax. Uh, it would frankly dramatically increase the size of our state's budget. Just over 2,400 businesses are expected to be directly taxed under the measure, but nearly every business would be impacted by the measure. That's because gross receipts taxes are 
inherently passed up and down supply chains. And unlike a traditional sales tax that's applied at the point of sale, gross receipts taxes are applied at every step of the supply chain. So even if you don't have sales above $25 million, chances are you're probably buying products from somebody who does. Maybe you're buying a product that goes through several steps in the supply chain where sales are above $25 million. There's a number of pieces of collateral on the, the barrel just in the middle of the room there. But one of them is this tax pyramiding example. This is exactly what we're talking about. So I realize you probably are having a hard time seeing it back there, but again, there are some copies of this available there. But this is our, this is our two by four example, and I'll just walk you through this real quick. So typically when we're talking about a two by four, we're talking about a, a forest landowner selling the actual logs. There's a 3% tax there. The mill then sells the two by four to a distributor. The distributor then sells to a retailer, and then the retailer sells it to you. I don't know about you, but I just recently uh, rebuilt my fence, and it felt like the price of wood was already pretty dramatically high. It felt like I was paying contractor prices just to do the project myself. Imagine what's going to happen if a tax like this were implemented, where the compounding tax increase is moving through those supply chains, and of course that's just one product. We're in a brewery, there's all sorts of different products and ingredients that go into making beer. Pretty much everything you're sitting on or looking on has multiple components in the supply chain that are potentially subject to this tax increase. Not surprisingly, when we're talking about a, a tax increase of this magnitude, there are some pretty significant impacts to our state's economy. The Legislative Revenue Office, which is uh, a nonpartisan office in the state legislature that really examines tax policy, they try to assist legislators in drafting tax policy, but also in understanding and modeling tax policy for its implications. And they determined that this measure, not surprisingly given what we just talked about, would increase inflation at a time where you all know inflation is already too high. It would result in fewer jobs, a decline in wages, a drop in pop and a drop in population growth, which uh, is all terrible news for our economy and for our state budget that is already perennially under that's uh, under stress. So because of the nature of this tax increase and some of those economic consequences, the Legislative Revenue Office found that this would result in a, a fairly substantial reduction to the state's general fund. So the state's general fund is what is used to fund our schools, our roads, public safety, health care. And you can see there, they're modeling a $1.2 billion loss in the 2025 and 2027 legislative session and a $2.8 billion loss in 27-29. They're actually modeling a loss to the general fund and every year they ran a simulation. That is an extraordinarily significant piece of this puzzle. You have all probably seen some headlines uh, about school districts looking for, for more funding. Portland Public Schools last year uh, famously went on strike for a little bit. All of those school districts rely on the state's general fund or our state police re rely on the general fund and it is you know, regardless of what you think of how much money the state has, it is, legislators are constantly in a place where they're having to prioritize what resources they do have and how to allocate those in the budget. This is not going to help with that. Whatever area of the budget you are most concerned about, a $1.2 billion loss, a $2.8 million loss, that is extraordinarily substantial within the context of our state's budget. Um, I'll skip to the bottom there. You know, one of the most important things about a gross receipts tax, and this, you know, if you talk to any economist across the country, they're probably going to tell you this. Gross receipts taxes, particularly a gross receipts tax at 3%, which is extremely high for a gross receipts tax, are inherently regressive. They hit lower income Oregonians, people relying on fixed incomes the most. That's because of the price increases we talked about. Uh, they are frankly devastating for Oregonians. Uh, at a time where prices are, are already far too high. We like to show this slide again. I, I recognize it's probably a little bit tough to see, but this is available online, and certainly I can share it with David. Uh, but we like to show this slide as a little bit of context on exactly what this tax increase would mean for different industries. I think one of the most important points here is while the, the impact is different across different industries, it's shared pain. Nobody escapes this measure. We're looking at an economy-wide tax increase. You can see wholesale and retail at the top there uh, in terms of the largest dollar amount increase, 1.5 billion for wholesale, 1.5 billion for retail. And of course, those two industries have a lot of interaction with each other within the marketplace. Uh, you can see on the 
right-hand side, the percentage increase for utilities, 1,801% projected increase in utility rates. So some pretty dramatic numbers. Um, and again, economy-wide, no industry exceptions or exemptions. Some of you might remember back in 2016, there was a very similar sounding measure on the ballot. It was called Measure 97. Uh, Measure 97 was also a gross receipts tax. Uh, it kicked in also at $25 million in sales. The rate was a little bit lower, 2.5%. Uh, but this is a very different conversation than Measure 97 for a couple of different reasons. One of Measure 97 was brought forward and sponsored by uh, largely public employee unions in Salem. It was intended, uh, according to them, to raise money to actually go into the general fund to help fund things like schools, healthcare, and other services. Uh, of course, Measure 118 that we're talking about today is a net loss to the state's general fund. And in fact, a lot of the unions that supported Measure 97 back in 2016 have actually joined the No on Measure 118 coalition. Uh, we're very proud to have what I, I sincerely believe is the largest of its kind political coalition in our state's history. But one of the reasons we, we bring up the Measure 97 fight is because it stands to this day as the most expensive ballot measure fight in our state's history. We'll see if that title gets replaced by Measure 118 here in a couple weeks. Uh, but you can see the final margin there, 41% yes, 59% no. That might sound like a big margin of defeat for Measure 97, but I can tell you from, from being involved in that campaign, it was very close all the way through it, and in fact, this race is very close. We have a lot of work to do to get the word out about this measure over the next 22 days. Uh, you'll start to see some, some paid advertising assist us in that effort, probably as soon as this weekend. Uh, but do not be fooled. While this measure might sound like a crazy idea to some of you, this is a very close race and we've got our work cut out for you. Uh, measure 97 showed that back in 2016 and it's a whole different political environment today. So just a little bit of an update on uh, what I spend a lot of my time doing these days, which is, is working on this campaign. So what are we doing? Oregon Business and Industry is, is leading the effort to defeat this measure. We have a steering committee with industry captains all over the state, folks who are experts in their industry, uh, who understand what this measure would mean for, for fishing, for manufacturing, uh, for timber, for retail, you name it. They're assisting us with our developing our arguments, with helping us spread the word. Uh, we're attending events just like this one. It feels like I'm on a full-time sort of bad news tour where I'm traveling to organizations like your own to, to spread the word about exactly what's at stake here. And of course, we've retained a number of experts and political consultants to assist us in running this campaign. We're not leaving any portion of this to chance. We have retained some of the best minds across the country to help us with this effort. The same team that helped us defeat Measure 97 in 2016 has in fact been retained to help us defeat Measure 118 in 2024. We do have a PAC, uh, you can search that PAC, it's called uh, Defeat the Costly Tax on Sales, if you uh, are familiar with the state's Oristar system. Uh, I'm kind of a political nerd, this is the, the time, if you couldn't tell. Uh, this is the time once every two years where they sort of let the political nerds out from behind the spreadsheets to attend things like this. Um, so that's where I, I sort of live every night looking at who's doing what in the political ecosystem, but you can certainly see what our campaign is up to there. But as I mentioned, uh, over 500 business, businesses, organizations, and elected officials have joined our coalition at this stage. We're really proud of that number. Um, this is a grassroots campaign. We are relying on those business, businesses, organizations like your own, um, individuals, frankly, just from word of mouth, to help us spread the word about this measure. In just 22 days, your friends and neighbors are gonna get a ballot that says something about increasing corporate taxes on sales of 25 million, and they're gonna ask you, what does this mean? We need your partnership in those conversations to help them understand exactly what the implications of a measure like this are. And certainly, if you're interested in joining the coalition, we'd love to have you. Um, I expect that this coalition is going to continue to grow and grow and grow all the way through Election Day. Uh, there's gonna be uh, a slide here at the end that gives you more information on how to join that coalition. Certainly some of the materials available there on the table can, can mark you to that place as well. Uh, we do have uh, just a broad away, array of what we call in politics collateral, bumper stickers, yard signs, you name it. Uh, some of those are available on the table there, but if you need more, and I hope you do, um, you can go to our website. Uh, there's a take action 
button at the very top of it where you can request more materials. Certainly help to be sending a, a bunch of yard signs, the big field signs that you see as you're driving past farms or um, heavily trafficked retail locations. Would love to be sending a, a bunch of those out there over the next couple of weeks. And then of course you will see TV commercials. Um, you're probably already seeing plenty of them. I actually uh, was fortunate enough to stop in here last night to grab a beer and it seemed like the congressional TV commercials were the only thing on TV at this point. Uh, this campaign will be joining that, that fold very soon um, and so you'll start seeing those all over the place as well. This is indeed our, our website and we also have the full suite of social media channels. We would encourage you to visit that website. I've been involved in a lot of campaigns over my career and I'm really proud of this particular website because you know we've all been to campaign websites. There's you know the general talking points and request a yard sign. This website in, in my opinion, and I'm a little biased, but in my opinion is among the most engaging and resourceful political websites I've ever been a part of. There are a number of different ways where you can in just a couple of different clicks engage directly in this campaign. You can download fact sheets you can download this two by four example. We'll soon be uh, adding a restaurant specific example. All sorts of resources and information to help you spread the word. We're really proud of the fact that we are we're sticking to a really fact based campaign, um, and our website reflects that. We firmly believe that when we spread the facts about this measure, Oregonians will come to their own conclusions, and that conclusion will be a no on Measure 118. We, of course, as any good campaign does, are in the middle of survey research and message testing. We are doing that constantly and will continue to do that constantly through uh, November 5th. Uh, what the research shows at this stage is that we, we're in a close race. We're in a very close race, but with the right messages and with, uh, frankly, partnership of organizations like your own, we can win. Uh, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a tough fight all the way through Election Day. It's, it's closer than I'd like it to be. Um, you know, they let us out from behind the spreadsheets this year, but this is also the time of year where we sleep a little bit less because we're worried about political races exactly like this one. But we know that when we share the facts about this measure, Oregonians understand that free money is never free. This promise of free money is going to come with a, a massive price tag of higher costs for everyday goods and services. Again, no industry exceptions or exclusions, so food, medicine, electricity, you name it, everything you buy is potentially subject to this tax. And folks understand they're going to pay higher prices when a tax of this magnitude is implemented. And of course, raising the funds necessary to, to mount this effort is a, a key part of our job. Uh, I mentioned where you can find all of our donors. Um, it's an open book, you're free to look there anytime. And certainly would love to have you if you're in a position to, to make a contribution to the effort, large or small. Um, this is an expensive campaign. Um, I mentioned those congressional races. They are driving up the cost of running races in Oregon dramatically. Uh, our TV buyer told us the other day, Oregon is one of the most expensive TV markets in the country. Um, that is pretty rare for Oregon. We're a state of uh, about four million people. Um, for our TV prices to be in the neighborhood of uh, much larger markets like Philadelphia, it's a little crazy, um, but that's the nature of the beast at this stage. We like to close with this. What are the top reasons to oppose Measure 118? Measure 118, as I've mentioned a number of times, is a costly tax on the sale of goods and services without exception, which will lead to higher prices. Groceries, utilities, gasoline, internet, insurance, even medicine, you name it, it's probably subject to tax under Measure 118, and the prices will go up. It's a tax on a tax, as we talked about in that lumber example. You probably have some of your own examples within your own businesses. But it applies at every step of the supply chain where there are sales above $25 million. The end result is higher prices for your businesses, higher prices for your customers. Measure 118 makes Oregon companies less competitive. Uh, raw materials and manufacturing outside of Oregon immediately have a competitive advantage. I don't know about you, but it already feels like a lot of times that businesses operating out of state already have a competitive advantage compared to businesses operating in this state. The cost of doing business here continues to go up. Uh, in fact, our organization did a study that said the, the business tax burden increased in Oregon by 43% from just 2019 to 2021 alone. And of course, as I mentioned, there's no guarantee anyone will see this money. 
it's effectively a $6.8 billion blank check for legislators. They can change it in any way that they want. So they can modify the measure by lowering the threshold, raising the rate, looping in more businesses, or taking some or all of the distribution. There is no guarantee that anyone will see any of this money. And finally, how you can get involved. Again, uh, we're easy to find. No one measure 118com That's sort of your portal to really anything you need from this campaign, but there is a QR code available here. Um, I'm just going to reiterate again. In a, in a time when there's only 22 days until Election Day, in a time when there's congressional races all over the place, you've got competitive local elections for the state leg legislature. I'm sure you have a number of local city and county races going on as well. There's a lot of noise out there and it's tough to get people's attention. The best way for us to reach people with the facts about Measure 118 is for you to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with your friends and neighbors, with your customers, with other vendors in your supply chain, and let them know what it would mean for your business, let them know what it would mean for their pocketbook, and help encourage them to, to vote no on Measure 118. I can't stress enough how important it is to have your partnership in our efforts to, to help spread the word about this measure. So 